Well, tonight we are lucky to have a treat coming for us. A permaculture superstar by the name of Michael. Um, to give you a bit of a background on him, um, began his permaculture journey 25 years ago. I know, I know he doesn't look old enough to have done that, but what do you say? Um, he picked up a copy of Permaculture One, as many of us did, uh, and the introduction to permaculture by Bill, Mo Bill Mollison. Um, uh, although it was some years later he first attended a PDC. Uh, he's applied design principles and ethics of permaculture to his personal life and is now enjoying the wonderful opportunities of being able to apply them to his workplace and community. He enjoys learning about the many different facets of permaculture and design and through his learning uh, also come to love teaching. Uh, finally jumped in after reading and applying what he had learned uh, having done a number of PDCs uh, followed by his permaculture teacher training with Roy Morrow and Nick Ritter. Uh, completed the Advanced Permaculture Design Principle Workshop with David Holmgren. Uh, and Advanced Permaculture Design with Dan Palmer and the Forest Garden Design Intensive with Dave Jackie, I think that's pronounced. Uh, as well as REX10 online with Darren Doherty, plus many more. Uh, aspires to be inspirational and practical as his teachers. Uh, and continue to do other courses to advance his knowledge and to increase the value which he can provide to his teaching, projects and consultations. Pretty damn impressive. So tonight he's going to be talking about garden fermenting. Uh, and this is the process of cultivating local microorganisms through simple, natural and affordable methods. Uh, garden fermenting, both anaerobic and anaerobic, sorry, aerobic and anaerobic, allows gardeners to create all organic and high grade living fertilizers in the gardens. Uh, in this discussion, he will look at uh, where these ideas have come from and how they can be applied. This will include how to make some of the ferments and how to apply them. Uh, so it's designed to enable anyone to become a microbial gardener. Michael has been applying these ferments in his gardens for over 10 years and taught from experience not only how we can create these ferments, but how to use them for maximum effect. Thanks, Michael. Over to you. All right. Thanks, Nev. And um, thank you for such a great introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Nev said, my name is Michael Wardle. I'm the uh, principal up here in Queensland for Save Us All Permaculture. I'm also honoured, though, to be able to uh, be the adult education coordinator at Northeast Street City Farm. So I'm fortunate enough to be able to live and breathe in this permaculture space full time. Uh, which is actually pretty cool. Um, now I'll just share my screen. If you just give me a second. All right. All right. Can everyone see that? All right, cool, thank you. All right, so when Nev asked, contacted me and asked me to give a bit of a, a presentation on the witchy brews, as, as, as we call them up here, um, you know, sort of like, you know, you've got half an hour to, to present, um, you know, something that I'd normally spend a full day talking about at least just for a basic introduction. So trying to wean it down to 30 minutes um, was pretty uh, interesting to be able to do that. So um, hopefully I can get across at least the basics within that time frame and give you some practical things to take home that, um, that shows that, you know, how you can use this stuff in your, in your own context. Um, so as I said, um, it's an introduction to, to garden ferments, but what we call them around here is witchy brews, uh, more so because when friends of mine do come over and come into my shed, it's bubbling and brewing all the time. Um, so it just, it's a name that um, started and seemed to have stuck. Now, I'd actually like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I am currently situated, which is the Kittable people, and honour their elders past, present and emerging. And hopefully that we can learn from these uh, lessons that are coming out and these wisdoms in the last few years so we can create that resilient, regenerative and abundant future. All right. Uh, this is me on paper. Uh, well, that's some of me on paper. Um, so, yeah, done a lot, but also learnt a lot as well. So, and it's constantly evolving at all times. Um, yeah, all right. So really coming down to this idea when you're talking about garden fermenting, it comes down to this idea of natural farming. All right, so this is not a new concept. Um, a lot of people, it's becoming uh, really popular in the last few years with regards to brewing microbes, but I'm a bit of a history geek and um, found that over time, that you know, people and cultures around the world, it's not just in one particular area, have been dealing and doing these practices for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is not new, all right? And so it's really interesting to see the different variations that came up in different climatic zones around the world, coming up with the same outcome, but different ways of being able to do that. All right, so this is a picture of my garden, all right? Um, 
really quite abundant, uh, but it wouldn't be where it is if it wasn't for these garden ferments. It's a supporting mechanism that I use to actually help produce the food that we eat here. Um, and this is just from last year alone. So um, I am very diligent in weighing my material as it's coming out. Um, it, sometimes it's really quite, pa uh, uh, quite painful because you know, you've got to sit there and do it. And, but for me, when you're really wanting to teach this stuff, making it quantifiable is really key. So when I'm using you know, not just the compost and the way I grow things, and there's a whole range of stuff I bring into play, tools and techniques, and the witchy brews are really part of it, but this was only done. So over three ton worth of produce, and it was done on quarter of an acre. All right. So I have a half acre available to me, but only a quarter of an acre is currently under development. I'm slowly but surely spreading out over the site. I've been here now for eight years. All right. And that was just from last year, from fruits, nuts, vegetables, herbs. Um, and of course, the honey and the eggs weren't had. Well, um, interesting enough, the, these ferments can be fed to the chickens through their water as well. It's actually helped boost their health. All right, which is really interesting as well. So um, yeah, to make it quantifiable and show what's really going on. All right, now I always like to start when I'm doing these sort of presentations, whether it be with regards to soil or ferments or something else with the lessons of the apple. All right, now the apple is really quite interesting because it was one of the fruits that's been tested time and time again for nutrient density over time. All right, now there was a study done in two, it was released in 2003 by David Thomas through Nutrition and Health, where they measured the mineral depletion in vegetables and fruits between 50 year period from 1940 to 1991. And what they found was the copper had declined in the, in the, in the fruits and vegetables by 76% in that 50 year period. Calcium had declined by 46, iron by 27, magnesium by 24 and potassium by 16%. That's really huge. Now, one of the big things that came out of that study is, and of course, when you're tying it into the lights of Elaine Ingham and Dr. Christine Jones with her work, is that it really coming down to those microbes in the soil, making the nutrients available, um, you know, really supporting that those, those microorganisms and that living biology to, so the, the plant and that biology can have that symbiotic relationship. So understanding that there's been the, this decline, and, you know, if we are what we eat, then when you're looking at what these figures in front of us, we wonder why they're starting to some of these issues that are cropping up from time to time. So to create that nutrient dense environment to feed my own children, all right? So I've got four teenagers. Um, I'm, I'm still up in the air about whether, you know, how, how, how positive of an effect that is on my life at the moment, um, as they're constantly toing and froing within their own um, little uh, issues at the moment. But that being said, the idea about getting nutrient dense food on the table for them so they don't, you know, so they can stay healthy and move on, okay, is really, really important to me and what I do here. All right, so what they came out of that study was that you would need to eat three times as much fruit and, and four to five times as many vegetables to get the same amount of minerals as available in the same foods in the 1940s. And it was about asking yourself these questions, really, can you eat that much? All right. So these were the questions I started asking myself. And this is not just recently. This is a long time ago when my kids were first born. And um, so it was like, okay, what can I do to help support this, to grow this, this food, to be able to, um, to, to um, support ourselves and feed ourselves? All right. Now, coming back from, a, from the micro of my own property back up to the macro and really coming down to where these ferments come from over time. So we, a lot of people have heard about Korean natural farming. It's become a very big thing in recent years where certain tools and techniques are used to brew these, um, not just um, uh, they brew these um, indigenous microorganisms um, so we can support our system. But interestingly enough, that's just one particular methodology. There's also European natural farming. So this is stuff that's gone on for centuries. All right, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a medieval um, history buff. Um, the 12th and 13th century during Constantinople period is, is my, my jam as it were. Um, and they were using this sort of stuff to be able to support. Interestingly enough, they, might have, they didn't understand what it was, but they knew it worked. And a byproduct of making what they called a peasant cheese actually, which we'll touch on later on, is um, built something called an LAB or lactic acid bacteria, which they in turn used on their garden. Now, they didn't understand why it worked, all right, but they understand it did work. So there's processes that come into play that can do that. All right. Now, also Mesoamerica as well, um, you know, different plants, different, different climate zone, different techniques. But again, it came out with the same outcome. Now, something that I really found interesting. Now, all of these cultures around the world that have done these natural farming methods has a level of fermentation that they've done for their own 
imbibement from time to time. Last year, I was reading an article that the First Nations people here in Australia actually had a ferment that they made from certain sap trees, all right, to, to, for, for, uh, to, to imbibe themselves. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at all the other cultures around the world that were doing natural farming, it actually started as a fermentation process for themselves. Now, the reason I got a question mark there is if, it's be, if they're starting to show that it did happen on that level, then what's the possibility that there are some natural processes here in Australia that has been, you know, that it might be available to them uh, to, to uh, brew up those really native microorganisms as well. That really excites me. So I'm doing a lot of research in that at the moment. I haven't found too much, but I'm still looking. All right. Now this is, um, they're now teenagers. They're now in high school. Um, they don't look quite that cute anymore and they don't get on as, as, as they do in that photograph. But what we're doing here was making an LAB. Now in their mind, they were just making cheese. All right. So the byproduct of this was making a cheese for them, which we in turn turned into a ricotta, which we turned into a baked cheesecake. I mean, there was a whole process that went in there. But what we were really ultimately after was the liquid that was coming out, which is the lactic acid bacteria. And I've got a recipe to show you later on. Um, if Nikki, if you're happy, I'll send through um, a um, PDF copy of this presentation, which has got the recipes on it for your for your group. Are you happy with that? Yeah, cool. Awesome. No worries. Okay. Um, all right. So this is my garden as it stands now. Now, as I said, you know, I produced a lot out of it over the last you know um, few years, and I'm now really quantifying that to to show what is possible on such a small scale. So what I started with is looking at those actively aerated compost teas. I mean, this is really quite common now. Um, a few years ago, it was sort of just starting to come to the surface, but it's something that we can really do. And it takes a handful of, you know, good compost or vermicompost that you've got available and multiplies it by a billion. All right. So one of the big issues I had is because of the level of intensity that I've been growing in my garden, spending time making that compost to be able to support that I didn't have enough time in the day. Okay, I'm running around after four kids. I've got, um, I'm relatively busy with regards to my business as well. So take, being able to take a handful of this or a couple of handfuls of this vermicompost or compost and turn it into something that can support my whole half acre was really, really important. So this is one of the, the tools and techniques that I use to be able to do that. So actively aerated compost teas. So, you know, taking 700 grams of balanced compost Okay, and 45 grams of, it talks about humic acids, but all you need is a, like a good handful of vermicompost, which has got a lot of humic acid in that as well. All right, 30 grams of soluble seaweed, if you've got it, if you make it yourself. If not, if you're further away from the coast, you may have to purchase that. All right, a tablespoon of liquid fish as well, and 30 grams of soluble molasses. Now, what you want, if you can, is get the stuff that doesn't have sulfur in it. All right, so mixing these together and brewing it up, what you're doing, like I said, you're taking those couple of handfuls of, of, of ingredients and brewing it up to a point where you can support such a larger area as far as the microorganisms is concerned. And all it was was a 20 litre bucket that I got from my local fish and chip shop. Didn't cost me anything at all. All right. And I spent $50 on some aerated stones to be able to do that. All right. But the ratio was it, the air that needed to be pumped through that bucket needed to be 20 litres per minute. So it, that's cost me about $50 to be able to do that. I, I was hoping to have a little bit of a video to, to show the process here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't work um, and the file got corrupted as I was uploading it this afternoon. Um, so I don't have that to show. But something as simple as, you know, filling this with unchlorinated water. All right. So and if, even if you don't have it like tank water or something, if you fill it with town water and leave it for 24 hours, the chlorine will gas off. All right, chlorine kills bacteria. The last thing you want to do is drop something in that you want to brew up in chlorinated water because it's just not going to happen. So allowing that to, to, to gas off for 24 hours and then throwing a couple of really good handfuls of compost within um, some sort of um, cheesecloth or chucks or whatever you've got available, tie it in, throw it in that bucket with those um, molasses, liquid fish and liquid kelp and then brew it up with the air stones for 24 hours that you'll see it, it'll foam up, it'll go nuts, all right? But that's the bacteria having a party. And it really helps to support the system, whether you're using it through um, a bucket just or a watering can to water onto your plants, because what you're doing is boosting the biology instantly, all right? And then, um, or use it as a foliar spray on the plants themselves, which actually helps support the plant health. Um, so that's just one quick, easy way of being able to do something. And like, this is, this is what I'm getting roughly on a daily basis, all right? So a huge amount of food that we're pulling from. And like I said, if it wasn't for the fact that these witchy brews or the likes of the aerated compost teas and the foliar sprays that are coming in, this just wouldn't happen. All right? I don't have enough time to produce the compost necessary to support this. All right, so um, yeah. 
Um, now getting into this idea of a lactic acid bacteria as well. All right, so this is really, um, this for me was revolutionary. Like I used to make it using um, apple cider vinegar and milk and heating it up slightly, but sometimes it overdid it with regards to um, the pasteurization of that. So it killed the biology within that. Um, now in the last few years, I was introduced to this idea using rice. I don't know if anyone's heard about that, but um, using rice to be able to brew this up and the byproduct is cheese on the top, lactic acid bacteria underneath and it takes anywhere between five and seven days depending on your temperature, all right? So in summer, like up here where I currently reside where my hat hangs, um, in the middle of summer, in the middle of February, you can get up to 50 degrees Celsius, all right? So if I'm brewing one of this, it's three days and it's done, all right? In the middle of winter, it can be anywhere up to seven days. So it's about timing and it's, you've got to keep an eye on it all the time um, because when it turns, it's that fast. And if you get to it quick enough, then you get access to the cheese before the molds and stuff get to it, which is really, um, well, I quite like it anyway. Um, so looking at this, the materials you needed to be able to do this. So you take some rice, okay? Um, most people have rice, um, whether uh, that, I, that I know of anyway. Um, and, you know, typically before they cook it, they rinse it. So in this instance here, what we're doing is just taking the rice, putting it in unchlorinated water and allowing it to, to rinse through. And it's that rice water with the starch and the other bits and pieces in it that we want. That is the initial stage that we're using. You take the rice away, you cook it, you have a dinner, you really feel satisfied afterwards. But you take that rice water or that rice rinse off, okay, and you put it in a jar and put a cover over the top. Now, the cover over top is not a sealed environment. It's like a, a paper towel or a muslin cloth or something else because it needs to have an exchange with the air. The bacteria we want, the indigenous microorganisms, we're breathing them in and out all the time now. And what we're doing is like when you're inviting a wildlife into your garden, you're creating habitat. Like you plant, you want a particular bird or a bee or something else, you're planting a particular flower, a particular tree. What we're doing is creating an environment to invite the microbes in to colonize. Okay, so we're taking that rice water and we're leaving it for anywhere between two and three days, again, depending on the heat, and that will slowly change. Now, you won't see a change in the water, it's the smell. All right. So the smell will go from no smell whatsoever till smelling really, really sweet. When it smells really sweet, I always say the nose knows. All right. So when it smells really, really sweet, you know it's ready because it's the that that bacteria, that lactic acid bacteria, has colonized it and is ready to go. It's had a had a bit of a party. At that point, we take some milk. Now, oh, sorry, wrong one. Oop, something's happened. All right. So we've taken some milk, and um, you can use any sort of milk really. Um, but if you want it, if you, if you have access to, you know, raw, unfiltered milk straight from the cow is always the best, not always an option. All right. Um, but any milk will do even the cheap milk. If that's all you have available to you, you can use this to be able to do this and it will still work. All right. Now, after three to four days and that's uh, that rice water starts to ferment and it starts to get that sweet smell. What you do is add one part of that liquid to 10 parts milk. All right, from there, you cover it back up with a, with a muslin cloth or a chucks or something else to allow, the, or paper towel to allow that air exchange. And then you put it in a dark corner somewhere and you let it sit for anywhere between another two to five days, again, depending on climate, depending on temperature. Now, for a while, it will just look like milk, a white substance, but it gets to a point where it splits. All right, and you'll see in this picture here that it's above that I've gone back in that it's split. So you've got curd sitting at the top and this liquid underneath. It's a liquid underneath that we want. What we've done is fed that bacteria lactic, you know, the, the lactose, and it's brewed up to a point where um, it's something that we can use and water down to use in our gardens. Now, interestingly enough, lactic acid bacteria is both aerobic and anaerobic. It can survive in both environments. So we brew it while it is in contact with the air, we're not air actively aerating it. So it's, it, it, is, it, can, it, it breeds up in an anaerobic environment, which makes it really easy to store, all right, which is the long term. Now, I only make a batch maybe once every six months or so because a one batch will, will last a long time. What you're looking at is roughly two tablespoons of lactic acid bacteria per nine litres of water. All right. And you only need to apply it to your gardens, you know, maybe once every two to three weeks. It's really not a lot. Um, and that actually helps boost what's going on in the soil. You can add it to your compost to speed your compost up as well. All right. Um, and it really adds a lot of benefits. And because it's, it, it's, it's something that is just naturally breathing, like I said, we're breathing it in and out now. If it accident, you accidentally swallow some, it's not going to hurt you. 
All right. Um, now, the way we're able to store that is now it's so, I've got here molasses or brown sugar. I actually find brown sugar better than molasses when it comes to storing. So we, we effectively use an equal weight of brown sugar and the, um, the, the, the strained liquid once we've taken the cheese out um, and mix it together. And basically, we give the, the, the bacteria a, a sugar high, as it were. So it gets really, really active and then goes to sleep, All right? which means we can actually just store it in our shelf without having to worry about putting it in the fridge. Um, I know that if I put something like this in the fridge, my kids are going to do something silly with it. So it actually sits out here in the shed. All right. And from there, um, you know, we only need to add a couple of uh, tablespoons to nine liters of water and then putting that out over the garden. If you want to use it as a foliar spray to help boost the health of your plant and the, and the intake of, um, um, you know, a lot of the nutrients through as it drips down into the soil. Um, again, it's only um, a couple of tablespoons per, you know, five liters of that, of a pump spray for foliar. Um, that's my favorite way of doing it because I get a lot more spread out of doing it than I do out of a watering can and it lasts a lot longer. And again, I'm only doing it once every two to three weeks. Um, but that's it. The difference it makes in the health of the plant is incredible. Um, and something that we, most people have available, um, you know, and it, what's as simple as it's just, you know, instead of a waste of that rice water, you're just tipping it down the sink, you're able to use that. Um, now, I can't see the chat at all. Has anyone got any questions at this point before we push forward? There at the moment, Michael. Sorry, what was that, Nikki? There are no questions there at the moment, thanks. Okay, no, that's cool. That's cool. I just thought I'd check before we move forward. All right, so that's a very easy and simple way of making an LAB. When the, the more medieval European method is they'd take the milk and they'd slowly heat it up and then they added the apple cider vinegar and you've got to watch it so it doesn't boil. And anyway, I much, much rather do this because I can just tip it in a bottle, walk away, come back in a couple of days and that's ready for the next stage. Add the milk, walk away, come back. All right, so, um, and that comes from Korean natural farming, that one. It makes a, a massive difference in the supporting of the health of the plant and boosting your biology really, really quickly. All right. And again, like I said, this is us making that LAB. Um, I think this was about 12 years ago, I think. All right. Um, and the byproduct being the cheese, which is something we can use and eat. Now, this is the difference with, um, with regards to the garden. Now, this is the same garden bed. Okay. Now, this is when it was first planted up. Now, this was incomplete compost that was used because I was rushing. I didn't, I needed to get the garden bed finished and moved on and I need to get it planted it up. So what I ended up doing was um, filling it with the incomplete compost. And as you can see, it really hadn't broken down a great deal. And I applied the LAB to it on a semi-regular basis. So at this point, it was once a week. And in a very short period of time, the plants grew. Now, the difference between the two photographs is four weeks. That's the difference that it can make. All right. Now, this was taken this time last year. All right. I didn't. I haven't got any recent photos, and I apologise for that because of, you know there's been teacher trainers, APCs, hospital visits. It's it's just been chaotic. All right. So I, my garden is not looking the best at the moment. Um, but you know when you're looking at the differences that are happening within this space, okay, it's the same garden bed, and it's a very short period of time in between. That's the difference of adding the right biology to it can make, whether through a foliar spray of an air actively aerated compost tea, or in this instance here, um, an LAB. And the LAB actually helped break down all that organic matter that was in that garden bed and created the soil that rich humic soil that's there now which helps support the plants that are growing in that space next to it um, so that's the difference um, which is which is really cool um, now um, this next one that i got up is actually from a book called the intelligent gardener i don't know if anyone's familiar with that book it's written by steve solomon um, now he um he, he wrote this book um, based on his experiences. Now, he was a very experienced organic gardener. Um, we followed organic principles right down to the T. But what he found is his health was deteriorating. There was lots and lots of things happening. And what he found was that even though he was doing it as organically as he possibly can, the microbes weren't being fed enough to be able to allow that nutrients to be available. So he's come up in, in his book. I, I listen, I highly recommend that book. It's absolutely fabulous uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, but he came up with this recipe he calls complete organic fertilizer. So um, scoff, oh, sorry, cough. Um, but everyone else calls it scoffs because it's Steve's complete organic fertilizer. All right, so it's basically using, um, you know, brew. Uh, it's not a brew, it comes out as a powder. And as you can see, this is a photograph of when I was mixing it up for one of the workshops as I was showing um, people how to do this. Um, and you're just measuring it out, mixing it together, and then lightly spreading it over the top of the soil. And what it's doing is actively... Um, supporting the biology that's happening that's already within that space and um, 
the recipe that I'm, I'm about to show you to brew this will cover about 10 to 15 square meters. It's only a really light dusting, um, but you only have to do about once every six months. Again, this is all about supporting biology um, to, to be able to allow that nutrient density. And it, he swears within this book that this is one of the reasons why his gardens and his health has recovered as much as it, as it has. Um, the difference between using it and not using it um, I found, especially when you're applying the foliar sprays, especially when you're applying the LAB as well, it just helps to support. Now, um, it's got down to a point by applying these things as I have, um, you know, I'm only doing about two hours worth of work in the garden a week, which is not a lot because I'm allowing the biology to do the work for me. You know, um, I've got black thumbs. Um, everything I used to touch died. All right. But that's before I realized black meant soil, not plant. All right, so really starting to understand, you know, where we need to put our effort and then let it do the work for us rather than constantly trying to, um, you know, reinvent the wheel. So what Steve came up with with, um, with his cough or complete organic fertilizer was, use, you know, four liters or four kilos of canola seed meal or copra. I use copra because what it's available, all right, which is ground coconut husk, basically. All right, there's enough protein and oils in that to be able to support um, biology and actually help multiply that. Um, now, one liter or one kilo of soft rock phosphate. I'm lucky enough that there is actually a soft rock, rock sock, <laughs> soft rock phosphate mine near me. All right, so it's a relatively local resource for me, um, and I can get it as um, with as as minimal um, embodied energy as I can. Um, a liter or a kilo of kelp meal. All right, um, half a liter of agricultural lime. Okay, half a liter of agricultural gypsum. Okay, a third of a cup of a potassium sulfate. Um, you know, a teaspoon of borax, all right, because Australian stores are notoriously deficient in borax. All right. Um, one and a half cup, oh, sorry, one and a half teaspoons of zinc sulfate. Um, one and a half teaspoons of magnesium sulfate and one and a half teaspoons of copper sulfate. All right. Um, again, most of these ingredients are relatively local to me that I can find. Um, and use now, um, and I, like I said, applying it, you know, maybe once every six months has made a massive difference to the garden and the life within that. I mean, I dig in the gardens now and the amount of worms and stuff that is in there because the worms are chasing the biology um, as they're eating it and eating the organic matter and doing all that sort of stuff as well. And all I'm doing is occasionally applying um, a little bit of this mix. And each of my garden beds are now, it's, you know, it's, um, I've got a very unpermaculture garden, apparently. It's all straight lines and squares and, and boxes and all that sort of thing. Um, but that being said, I know exactly how big the beds are. I know exactly the rotations. Everything is standardized. Um, and, you know, this, this particular mix is enough to do um, eight of my garden beds. All right. So when you're looking at how many garden beds I got out there, knowing the exact figures means I know exactly how much to make to be able to support that. Um, yeah, and again, it's all about supporting the biology. Um, and, you know, this was actually a photograph taken a couple of years ago, but um, this was after I, I should have actually put up a photo of what it looked like before. Um, but I applied the um, complete organic fertilizer, planted it up, and this is what happened. Um, the difference was chalk and cheese. Um, just absolutely massive. That, that um, silver bead that you can see there was, um, you know, like twice the size of my hands. It was just huge. Um, the flavor was just so intense. And um, again, the worms, um, the life that was happening in and around that space was incredible. And it was probably, that was the, the first year that it went from such a massive task of, you know, working before sun to after sun to be able to produce this level of food um, to really mim minimalizing it. Um, because I was you know, focusing more on the biology and the soil doing the work rather than me doing the work. Um, yeah, and that was just, like I said, that was just one application. And every year it's getting better and better. Ultimately, it's, I'm, I'm hoping to get to the point where I don't have to um, add it anymore. But like anything, our soils have been so depleted and for lack of a better term, strip mined for the, you know, a couple of hundred, if not thousands of years, um, that we need to start really focusing on that initial input. So therefore we don't have to, we can self-cycle later on for that, those closed loop systems. 
Um, all right, so fermented plant juices. All right, so this is really interesting process, um, taking what you know naturally we have already growing in our garden and being able to really concentrate that for it to be able to use to expand whether, like I use these, these particular witchy brews in my bioponics units um, for my trees, as well as for my vegetable patches as well. For me, it has to have multiple purpose. It's not, this is only for this, this is only for this, um, because I don't have time. All right, so what the, the stuff that I use has got to have multiple users. So when I do apply it as a foliar, I do everything at once. All right, um, just makes it easier. So I like to talk about this one with regards to the humble cabbage. I mean, you know, this time of year, most people, if they haven't got their cabbages in already, they're not far away. Um, and when they grow, you know, uh, typically there's a lot of excess, you know, the leaves on the outside that you peel off, typically you can either go to compost or feed the chickens or whatever else. But, you know, there is something else that we can do with them as well. If we harvest them first thing of a morning, just as the sun's starting to rise and it's got that dew point on them, that's actually the time it's got the most amount of biology on those leaves. Right, before the light of the day hits them and starts to burn it off. But the thing is with regards to a cabbage, when you're looking at it, this is the nutrient availability that is in a cabbage. So it's naturally got an element of boron, calcium, chromium, copper, iron, nitrogen, potassium, and sulfur. So what we're doing when we're looking at this is taking those leaves when we harvest them, and then we're using this process to be able to concentrate those nutrients so we can self-cycle it back into our system. What it means is I don't have to go out ultimately I'm having to purchase less and less to balance out my soils in the first place because I'm cycling what's already here. All right. Um, I don't know if anyone else finds this exciting, but I, this is my, I'm pretty excited by this sort of stuff. All right. You may have noticed. All right. So what we're looking for is, and it really comes down to that first design principle in permaculture, observe and interact. So you're looking for plants that are strong against the cold and grow well in spring. All right, so really hardy stuff, you know, and it's going to be different for everyone's environment. All right, plants that grow fast and are vigorous, you know, like the, the tomato suckers as well. If you've got them, you can use those, you know, um, be careful when you're using fruit. Actually, we might ignore that for the moment because um, if you prick it at the wrong time, it can actually be detrimental to your system. I shouldn't have put that in there and I apologize. Um, avoid days where there's excessive sunshine or rainfall because we want that biology on that on those leaves to be able to maximize that. Okay, collect the ingredients before the sun rises, um, shake off any dirt from the plants and we don't wash it in water. We want what is currently there. All right, We want to cultivate that. And we cut it all up into sizes between three and five centimeters. All right. We don't mix different plants together. So if you're just doing, if it's a cabbage, you just do cabbage. All right. If you're doing um, silver beet, just do silver beet. If you're doing mulberry leaves, just do mulberry leaves. All right. So you're focusing on one at a time. Now we measure the weight of the plant material. Once we've cut it up, we measure it up. It's important because we're going to be using that later on. Because what we do is we take that weight and we use brown sugar to half of what the plant weighs. So if you've got a kilo worth of plant matter, once you've cut it up, you want half a kilo of brown sugar. Now, um, has anyone experienced making sauerkraut at all? You know, adding salt and, and doing this. We're doing exactly the same process, but instead of adding salt, we're using brown sugar. So we're mixing it in. We're mass slowly massaging it. Your hands get really gritty and that sort of thing. You know, um, you know if you're really textile, you know, it, it can be quite satisfying. Um, getting in there, massaging it up. And what you'll notice is the liquid will automatically, in a very short period of time, start to just weep out of what you're massaging. Okay, that's what we want. It's the liquid. All right. Now you put that in a jar. And again, you put something over the top to allow an air exchange. Um, so therefore, it, it's in contact with the, with the air and the biology that's happening in that. And the osmosis through adding the sugar, that massage, will actually burst the cells and release the nutrients all right, into that liquid form. Okay, um, you cover it and, and leave it with a paper towel and a rubber band. And it can, again, it can, the, the time frames can vary subject to your climate. You know, if it's really moist, if it's really dry, um, but you'll know when it's done because you'll find that the, the leaves that you've used are all basically shriveled up. Okay, and there's this huge wad of liquid on the bottom. It's the liquid that we want. But the dilution of that, okay, is one to 800 to one to 1000 ratio. It's really minimal, but what it is, is really concentrating that nutrient within that space and then being able to spread it out. So it doesn't take a lot to do, to do a lot, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm using different stuff all the time. So different plants at different times of the year, because it's just depending on what's available and where you are in, in, in Sydney West is going to be vastly different to, to what I have up here in Laidley in Queensland. Um, but understanding that, 
you know, through that thoughtful observation in the first place and looking at the plants to see which are doing really, 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 really well during those times when you need to make it. Uh, and that's what you select to do it. Now, when you're applying this liquid, um, liquid, plant, for, uh, liquid plant ferment, it's only during the initial stages of the plant growth and then the vegetative stage. So when the leaves and stuff coming through, not when it flowers and not when it fruits. All right, because what we're doing is we're using the leaf for leaf the leaf to support the leaf growth. All right. It sounds a bit wooey, I understand that, but there is method to the madness. All right. Like I said, they were doing this stuff during the middle ages. They didn't understand why, but it worked. All right. And we're now starting to understand some of the science in behind this. So like I said, you know, one to 800 ratio, one to 1000 ratio, it really is quite concentrated and you can get a lot out of this. And it's stuff that you can grow, like you're using stuff that you're growing on your own property. The only input might be brown sugar. All right, which is really quite cheap and easy in the scheme of things. Okay, you store it in, in, in glass or in glazed pots. I use Focola jars because at the moment, um, everyone's getting rid of Focola jars because they don't want to replace the lids and the seals because it costs too much. So they're just getting rid of them. So I've got a whole huge stack of them. I use that. Um, you keep that once it's finished, you keep it out of the sun. Um, you should keep it in, if you keep it in the refrigerator, it will last up to 12 months. All right. So if you don't leave it in the fridge, it'll only last a, a month or so. But if you leave it in your fridge, it will last up to 12 months. Just make sure it's not your wine fridge or your, you know, um, you know, something that you go to regularly. Just keep it in somewhere separate. I always like to keep it separate anyway. So fermented plants juice will be ready between five and seven days. Okay. And store it in a cool dark place. Really simple, but it has a lot and a massive effect with regards to supporting that initial vegetative stage of the plant. All right, now the next one we're gonna be looking at, um, like there's so many different recipes to choose from. I've just cherry picked this to try and make it as easy as possible. Um, the fermented uh, fruit juice um, is the next one. Now, when we talk about leaf for leaf, we're talking about fruit for fruit. So the fruit is to support the flowering and the fruiting stage of the plant, okay? Um, yeah, that's an easy way of being able to look at it. Um, so think of it almost like an artificial honey. All right, it's what we're creating to be able to support this. So we're looking at you know, nutritionally active uh, activation of enzymes, uh, revitalizing crops and livestock. Okay, I've seen it used on livestock. I don't, I, occasionally I'll put it in with my chicken water and, and ducks as well, and it helps them boost their health. Um, but the thing is, the caveat is when you're looking at this, if you're using grapes, only on grapes. If you're using citrus, only on citrus, because there are acids within it that can actually damage other plants. All right, and we want to actually support the plant growth not um, damage it. I actually accidentally used citrus fermented um, fruit juice on um, an apple tree once and it, it, it didn't do well. It didn't go well. It actually burnt the leaves. Um, it caused lots of issues and, the, and I had flower drop and that was just my own stupid mistake because I just wasn't thinking at the time. Okay, um, so what you're doing is you're preparing at least three different types of fruit, but you don't mix it during the fermentation stage. You only mix it afterwards. So, you know, looking at the likes of, you know, bananas and apples and I don't know, something else, pick one. I don't know, whatever you've got growing in your system. All right, so you're looking for with, when you're looking at roughly a kilo worth of fruit ingredients, so you're looking at 1.2 to 1.3 kilos of brown sugar. Again, you cut it up into those three to five centimeter bits and you massage the sugar into it. Um, and then once it starts through that osmosis, you put it in a jar, you cover it up with something to allow that air exchange, leave it three to five days, and then ultimately you'll end up with that liquid on the bottom. And that's what we want. And again, you're looking at about a one to 800, one to 1000 ratio water down. All right, so you really don't need a lot to do this. And that supports the flower and the fruiting stage of the plant all right, to really help boost um, what's happening there. Um, make sure your jar is clean and you know, sterilized um, because if it's not, it's easy to do. And I've done that myself. I just grabbed a jar and I filled it up and it had something else in it, which actually outcompeted what I was trying to do. Um, and it just went off, all right? Um, yeah, basically this is just going through what we just talked about. And again, it takes you know anywhere between five and eight days, um, depending on the ambient temperature of what's going on. Um, but we need to, you need to, you don't put a lid on it to uh, exclude the air and actively needs that exchange with the biology um, with the air that we're, like, we're breathing in and out now. All right, I understand we're running out of time. I do apologize. Okay, Nev asked me not to ramble on too much. So 
<laughs> All right, almost done. All right, so soluble calcium. Okay, this is a really cool one. Um, I don't know if anyone's experienced this at all, but again, eggshells, very common product if you've got chickens. Um, but you know, you might be having, for example, uh, tomatoes that have got blossom end rot or something else like that. Typically, it's showing that you know it's not that there's a calcium deficiency. Typically, it's a magnesium deficiency, um, but um, the calcium is bound and unavailable to the plant. This is something that we can do to actually really help support the plant growth, not only for that calcium deficiency, but calcium also good for cell development as far as the plant's concerned. And so doing this and being able to use it as a foliar spray on your plants actually can help support that. And because it's using um, the liquid calcium, and I'll show you how in a minute, um, it actually can actually create a little bit of a, a film on the outside of a plant, which actually can help it from fungal, protect it from fungal spores as well, um, which is actually really cool um, for doing that. So what I do is I take eggshells and I put them in my mortar and pestle and I ground them down. Um, <laughs> when I'm running out, actually, I tend to run a workshop and I show people how to do this and they come and grind down the shells and then we apply it. So, you know, it just makes it easier depending on how you want to do it. Um, but grinding down the shells um, and then applying apple cider vinegar. Now, whether you make your own apple cider vinegar, um, but I've also found that if you make a really, really strong vinegary kombucha, it will do exactly the same process. So you don't have to buy it if you're already making this stuff as well. But what you're doing is you're just adding the apple cider vinegar, all right? So all it is is ground eggshell and apple cider vinegar. And give it a second, any second now. Here's one we prepared earlier. All right. You'll see it's starting to bubble. There we go, boom. So what that's doing is actually extracting the calcium out of the eggshell and making it soluble within the apple cider vinegar. So you're taking something that's stable and turning it into something soluble, which you can use as a foliar spray or a soil drench or something else as well. And again, it's only a couple of tablespoons per nine liters of water. You really don't need a lot, all right? Um, and that can actually help support the calcium availability as far as the plant's concerned. The reason why we apply it as a foliar spray more than as a soil drench is because there's, or typically you'll find like calcium is, is one of the elements that doesn't move very much within the soil. Um, and if it's bound, now the plants that are suffering from a calcium deficiency, their leaves and bark and stuff act like a skin. Like us, if we pour something on our skin, we can actually draw it in and it come within our system. It's exactly the same as far as the plants are concerned. So applying it as a foliar spray is a really quick, easy way of being able to do, to, to fix a potential issue um, for while we work out what's going on for that long-term um, sustainability. All right. All right. Yeah, okay. We've done that. All right. So to add another layer to that, while you know coming down to the idea of you know thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can transform from one thing to something else. Now, taking the same thing, eggshells and apple cider vinegar, and applying the eggshells, you grind them up and apply heat. So when you apply heat, there's a, a chemical reaction that happens within the eggshell. And now you use it as a dry fry. So you grind up the eggshells, you throw them in your fry pan with no water or no oil, and you slowly heat up the pan. You'll notice that the crushed up eggshells will start to change color. So some will turn black and others will turn white. The white is calcium, the black is phosphorus. So there's actually an element of, yeah, and it's not really available until its heat is applied, which is something really interesting. So what you do is you do that. And then after you've got about 50% black and 50% white, you do the same thing and apply the apple cider vinegar and you've got something called calphos. So liquid calcium and liquid phosphorus, all right, which is really good for supporting a plant's growth as far as it's not only um, cell development, but also fruit and flower development as well, um, which is something we can apply as a foliar spray. And again, excess eggshell, you know, something we can use. Most people have, um, and you don't necessarily have to use apple cider vinegar. If you brew your own really strong kombucha, it'll have exactly the same process. Um, and here's the recipe to be able to do that. Um, but the only difference is between um, soluble calcium and calphos is that you've just applied the eggshells on a dry heat uh, for a period of time until 50% is black, 50% is, is, is that white. Um, and that's the only real big difference. Now it will keep um, for some time, um, like I said, you know, I typically have this, I've still got some on shelf that's, um, I don't know if you can see it, I'll get it really close. Um, this is the stuff I made for that little video. It's already started to settle down, but I'll leave this sit for two or three days. Um, some places recommend, and I think I've actually put it in there. Um, yeah, it says seven to 14 days. Um, again, subject to heat 
humidity, all that sort of stuff comes into play as well. Um, while the lid is on, it is only very loose. All right, that's to stop it frothing up and bubbling over the top and me having to clean up a mess later on. Um, so it's really, really loose, still allowing for an air exchange. Um, and that is something like I said, we can use as a foliar spray to help support um, our plants. Um, now that's what I had come up with something really quick and easy for people that like it can re get really really specific as far as these 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 witchy brews are concerned where you can take a plant and really refine it if you find that there's a deficiency within your system uh, after a period of time you can really start identifying and narrowing down the different nutrients available for your system so you can take a plant and then you know effectively through um, differentiation narrow down particular elements that you can actually use to support your system um, but the ones i chose here are really quite general and broad and really easy to apply um, that anyone can use um, and i really like this quote finishing with masanobu fukuwaka that you know the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops but the cultivation and perfection of human beings where you know really us as stewards of this system and if we really want to create this clo as closed loop as we possibly can we not only need to look at the damage that has been done but what we can do to support that and help rebuild those systems so that ultimately it'd be more self-replicating for us for that resilient regenerative and abundant future right. now that was a lot of information in a very short period of time i understand but does anyone have any questions that was absolutely fantastic, Michael. That was just amazing. Uh, there were some questions in the chat box. I know Arun had one earlier. I'm just going to scroll back through to find it. Please, thank you. Uh, but I'll actually stop recording here as well. Okay.